Hello everyone and welcome to Unit 7.2, Fluvial Morphology and Sediment Regime. You may hear a little bit of background street noise during this lecture. I apologize for that. I'm recording this from Kigali in Rwanda and this is the quietest spot I could find. But in this lecture we'll look at key features and processes of fluvial morphology related to eflows and we'll consider the concept of a sediment regime. Sediment accumulations of the river channel, its riparian zones, and floodplains are the physical template for habitat formation. But it's not a fixed template. Rivers are continually changing form in response to long-term geological and climatic processes, as well as seasonal and annual patterns in hydrology and river hydraulics, which repeatedly build, tear down, move, and rebuild the physical template organisms depend upon. Let's begin by looking at some of the relationships between river corridors, their flows, and sediment loads. Flowing water is a powerful erosional force in the geological cycle, combining with chemical and other physical forms of erosion to level mountains and transport sediments to the sea or inland basins. River corridors are the pathways for sediment transport and display characteristic patterns along their longitudinal lengths. Note the three primary zones of river corridors labeled along the top of the figure on the right. Headwaters lie in the highest elevation zone of the river. Headwater river corridors are characterized by steep slopes and large grained bed material. In headwaters, the capacity of flows to erode and transport sediments typically exceeds the rate of sediment supply or deposition, so only large material remains in the river channel. Discharges are relatively small because headwater zones are dominated by streams and small rivers. Further downstream, river corridors become less steep and channels and flows grow larger. These middle reaches are referred to as the transfer zone because sediment erosion and deposition are more balanced and transport dominates. The amount of fluvial sediments, or alluvium, stored in the river corridor is still relatively small in transfer zones but begins to increase as the slope of the river further decreases. Finally, the river corridor enters the deposition zone, where slope is at its minimum and flow is at its maximum. This is a zone in which deposition exceeds erosion and large amounts of alluvium accumulate. Delta areas are an example of depositional zones in river corridors. The photo on the left is a good example of a river in the transfer zone. We'll look more closely at the morphologic features in rivers like this a little bit later in lecture. Let's look a little more closely at the capacity of rivers to transport sediments. This figure shows the relationship between the frequency and magnitude of river flows to the load of sediment transported. First, look at the curves labeled frequency and sediment discharge rating curve. The frequency curve plots the frequency of different discharges in a river. The most frequent discharges are low flows, and higher flows occur less and less frequently. The sediment discharge rating curve plots the relationship between the sediment discharge and water discharge. This is a positive relationship, and sediment discharge increases exponentially with increasing water discharge. But note that sediment discharge is virtually zero at low flows, which occur most frequently. This means that most sediment transport occurs only at higher flow levels and therefore infrequently. The final curve on the graph plots the product of sediment discharge magnitude and frequency. The highest point on this curve is called effective discharge, which is the single discharge responsible for transporting the most sediment. Lower flows occur more frequently, but transfer less sediment overall, while higher flows transport more sediment per unit time, but occur less frequently, so they also transport less sediment than the effective discharge. Like bank full flow in hydraulics, effective discharge is quantified for many rivers and used as a standard for comparison among rivers. Now let's narrow our focus more and look specifically at the influence of flow velocity on the erosion, deposition, and transport of different grain sizes of sediment. The graph shows diameter of sediment on the x-axis and flow velocity on the y-axis. Both scales are logarithmic. Note that the range of sediment diameters relating to clay, silt, and sand are shown in detail, 
while the range of larger grain sizes, including gravel, pebbles, and boulders, is shown, but not the exact divisions between them. The wide red curve shows the velocity required to erode the different grain sizes, and the thin blue line shows the velocity below which sediment grains will be deposited. Together, the erosion and settling curves delineate zones of erosion, transport, and deposition on the graph. Note that higher velocity flows are required to erode both clay and larger grain sizes. The high velocities required to erode and transport large grains is not a surprise and relates to the mass of the grains. The high velocity required to erode clay and fine silt may surprise you. This is due to the cohesive forces between the small grains. These are electrostatic forces that are lost as soon as the grains are eroded. Note that once these grains are eroded, flow must come to a standstill before they will be deposited. Larger grains, by comparison, have only a narrow range of velocities at which transport occurs. So these grains move only during the largest floods and those only for very brief periods of time. The easiest grain sizes to erode are fine to medium-sized sand. The strong relationships between erosion and settling velocities of different grain sizes explains the clear sorting of grain sizes in rivers. The photos on the right show extreme examples of this. The cobble and boulder beds on the left are the result of flow regimes with regular high velocity flows that have flushed away any fine grains. These are characteristic of beds of headwater streams and rivers. The sand channel on the upper right is more typical of the beds of rivers in middle reaches, or the transfer zone we saw in the last slide, while the mud channel is more typical of a river mouth uh, near the sea. Of course, it is also possible to find all of these grain size accumulations in a single river channel because of the large differences in velocity that occur in complex channels over variable levels of flow. Such heterogeneous beds also provide the most variable habitat types for organisms. Insects and spawning salmonids will make use of the gravel and cobble sections, while riparian vegetation will make use of the sandy banks of rivers. Over time, imbalances in erosion and deposition will cause rivers to aggrade or degrade. This happens on many scales ranging from the whole basin to individual river reaches. Aggradation is a steady infilling or buildup of the river channel due to an excess of deposition, while degradation is a steady downcutting of the river channel due to an excess of erosion. The balance between these two conditions is illustrated very well by the cartoon scale on the slide. On the right side of the scale, we see the factors of slope and water discharge represented, which are also both related to flow velocity. Note that the weight of this side of the scale will increase as the amount of discharge increases and as the slope increases. On the left side of the scale, we see factors of sediment size and load. The weight of this side of the scale increases as sediments become larger and as load increases. When the weight of the left side of the scale exceeds that of the right, the river will aggrade. When the weight of the right side of the scale exceeds that of the left, the river will degrade. Pause the video if needed to examine this scale more closely. The photos show an example of an aggrading river and a degrading river. Be aware, as well, that human alteration of these factors can also cause a river to aggrade or degrade, thereby changing the nature and amount of sediments and related habitats for river organisms. The interacting processes of sediment erosion, deposition, and transport produce a wide variety of fluvial landforms as listed on the right-hand side of the slide. Some of these, like riffles and pools, I've already mentioned, and others, like towheads and terraces, I'll not have time for. So you might want to take a moment and Google some of these for yourself, just to get a feeling for the full range of features possible in natural rivers. Many of these are ecologically significant. For now, I'd like to focus on the meandering river in the graphic and some of its features. Note the channel meandering through a flood plain. During floods, the river will spill over its banks and out onto the flood plain. Under these high velocity flow conditions, the river is likely to be transporting a large load of large grain sizes of sediment. As flow overtops the river bank, velocity drops quickly and larger grains are deposited to form natural levees. 
while finer grains are transported farther onto the floodplain with the more slow-moving flood waters. The most distant part of the floodplain may accumulate mud in back swamps. Occasionally, there may be breaks in the natural levees and high energy river flows may spill through to form small floodplain deltas called crevasse splays. In the channel itself, flow is fastest and most erosive on the outer bend of meanders, as you see in the image on the lower left. This causes erosion on the outer bank, which is called the cut bank. Conversely, flow is slower on the inner bank, or point bar, and this leads to deposition. Combined, the erosion of the cut bank, followed by deposition on the point bar, causes rivers to slowly move across floodplains, a bit like the movement of a slow-moving snake. Meanders that grow too long will also be cut off by the river, forming what are called oxbow lakes. These are common and ecologically important features in a section of the middle Mara River in Kenya, which we've featured throughout this course. As we've learned, classification is an important part of river science and, by association, e-flow science, because it provides a framework for understanding the status of rivers in form and function, and also allows for comparison between rivers. A number of classification systems have been developed for rivers, ranging in level of detail as well as suitability for different purposes. Perhaps the most widely used classification system is that developed by Rosgen. I'm not going to say much about this because I've included a link to a small training on the Rosgen system in the additional resources section of this unit. To give you a sense for the system, I've included the level one classes on the slide. Level one classes feature river characteristics resulting from relief, landform, and valley morphology. Level two classes, which are not shown, provide more detail about channel form and bed composition. Level 1 classes range from class AA plus to class G. These classes organize rivers along a gradient of decreasing slope. Classes AA plus, A, and B are mainly headwater streams, while classes C through F include rivers in the transfer zone, but with differing channel forms. Class G refers mainly to smaller gullies feeding into larger rivers in low relief areas. Especially in classes C through F, there is a large amount of information about relative magnitudes of erosion, deposition, and transport over different time scales reflected in the class designations. I encourage you to have a look at the web link to explore this more. Measurement of sediment load is similar in some ways to the measurement of discharge. In fact, discharge is required to compute load, which is the product of discharge times the concentration of sediment in transport. You'll remember the description of discharge measurements from the last unit. At the same time discharge is measured, hydrologists should also collect sediment samples to be dried and weighed to quantify the grams of sediment per liter of water. When this value is multiplied by the number of liters per second of flow, the sediment load in grams per second is determined. Accurate sediment sampling is challenging, however, because sediment concentrations vary with depth in the river and also with position across the river. This is due to relationships between the flow velocity and transport capacity presented in slide 4. A sampling system to deal with this variability is shown on the slide. It consists of a collection vessel oriented into the flow with an interchangeable nozzle that can be larger or smaller depending on the river size or velocity. This sampling system is lowered from a boat or bridge at a constant rate over the entire vertical profile of the river. The bottle fills at a rate proportional to the flow velocity, so it provides both a depth and discharge integrated value for sediment concentration. This provides an accurate value for the quantification of sediment load. Hydrologists and geomorphologists are also working to develop reliable methods for measuring sediment loads using ADCPs, but we're still in the early days of these efforts. But sediment does not only move in suspension. Some larger grain sizes are almost never found in suspension, but they do move downstream along the bottom in what is called bed load. This is more difficult to measure, but samplers have been designed, like the one you see in the photo on the left. There are also weighting techniques using nets, as you see on the right. 
To end this lecture, I'd like to introduce you to the concept of the natural sediment regime, which was proposed in 2015 by Ellen Wall and colleagues to expand the natural flow paradigm to include consideration of the natural sediment regime in river systems. But defining and quantifying a natural sediment regime is extremely difficult compared to flow regime. One reason is that significant human alteration of river sediment regimes dates back earlier than alteration of flow regimes and has also been more severe. This is because land use change and other early human interventions have more pronounced impacts on erosion processes and sediment transport than on water runoff. A second reason is the comparatively limited data set available. For example, over 33,000 USGS gauging stations have flow records longer than 10 years, but less than 2,000 sites have records of suspended sediment concentration longer than 10 years. Only nine sites have records longer than 50 years. Data from one of these, the Maumee River of Ohio, is shown on the slide. Days of the year appear on the x-axis, years on the y-axis, and suspended sediment load on the z-axis. Assessments of regional change in sediment regimes are limited to the deltas of major river basins, which in most cases have been significantly altered for more than a century. Given the rarity of sufficient knowledge of truly natural sediment regimes, Wall and her colleagues recommend instead that rivers be managed to achieve a, quote, balanced sediment regime. This conceptual framework begins with quantifying sediment budgets, which involves measuring sediment inputs and outputs from river sections. As the figure on the slide indicates, inputs should include sediment transported from upstream as well as from adjacent uplands, tributaries, and floodplains. Output should also be measured in these longitudinal and lateral directions. They recommend analyzing sediment inputs and outputs in terms of magnitude, frequency, and duration, and to compare the dynamics of these loads in different river sections to better understand overall dynamics and influences on the component of sediment stored in, river, in the river channel, banks, or floodplains over different time periods. As we've seen in this lecture, it's the stored component with its characteristic volume, bed forms, grain size distribution that exert the strongest control on the abundance, distribution, and stability of habitats for river organisms. The management goal, in the author's view, should be to seek a balance that develops and maintains the channel form and habitats needed to meet environmental objectives. Achieving a balanced sediment regime that contributes to meeting environmental objectives involves simultaneous consideration of water and sediment flows. Sediment flows are managed on the landscape mainly by erosion control measures, given that excessive sediment input is the most widespread situation. An exception would be sediment-starved river reaches downstream of dams and reservoirs. Under these circumstances, sediment must be added to those depleted reaches either by flushing sediments from reservoirs or other means. At the same time, water flows must be managed to transport and distribute sediments into channel and bed forms of appropriate grain size. The interactions between the controlling and resulting factors are illustrated on the slide. Incoming water and sediment regimes influence the valley context, including the valley geometry, substrate, and vegetation characteristics. These then influence the reach scale characteristics, such as river cross-sections, form, and gradient. Under the extended natural flow paradigm proposed by these scientists, water and sediment dynamics must be understood and managed as closely coupled elements. I expect this is clear to you as well after the lectures and reading in this unit. So what are the take-home messages? First, river morphology is the physical template for riverine and floodplain habitats, and it varies in predictable ways from headwaters to river mouths depending on basin characteristics and hydraulics, which are themselves related to geology and climate. We learned that erosion, deposition, and transport are the main processes controlling geomorphic change in river channels, and these can be altered in many ways by human interventions. And finally, we heard about the natural sediment regime, an effort to expand the natural flow paradigm to consider the interacting factors of flow and sediment. That's the end of this lecture. Thanks very much.